皆さんこんにちは、えー、今日はあの20世紀の、えー、天才バイオリニスト、えー、名指導者でもあったイエフディ・メニューインですねこの方の、えー、と指導法に基づいて、えー、楽器の構え方をね少し解説したいと思います後ほどねあの動画もでもご紹介するんですけどこのメニューインが書きましたこのバイオリン奏法というのがですねこれがねその動画に基づいて作られてる本なんですよね結構おすすめですはいえー、っとねバイオリンはあの構えるのにねあのこうガッとねこう挟み込んで貼る方いらっしゃいますけどこれねあまり良くないですよねこう,こう挟むっていうことの行為がもうこれでねもうかなりこう首とかに力入ってるんですよですからやっぱりどうしてもねあのそれが雑音になりやすいんですこう力入ってるこういう感じねですからあまりこうガッと挟むんじゃなくて型はこうフリーにしておくこれこういうフリーにしておいてこうするとかなり楽に音が出せるようになってくるんですねこっちのね、左手で支えるっていうことが大事なんです。あの、鈴木教法の第一巻にね、男の子で、あの、こう、肩当てをして、こうやって、こうやって手を離しても支えられるみたいなね、こう写真が載ってあるのをご存知の方もいらっしゃると思うんですけど、これで、ね、あもう最初の方だけにしていただきたいですね、できたらね。この肩当て片当てはまあ絶対あかんとは言いませんけどこうガッと挟,挟み込んで練習するっていうのはねもう本当に最初だけにしてもう慣れてきたらこっちの左手で支えてあの練習するっていうふうにしていただけるのがいいと思います。あの肩当てされてる方でもねあの上手な方はねあんまガッと挟み込んでないですよ。ほとんどこっちで持っててこっちあの顎をこう上げたりして引いてらっしゃる方もいらっしゃいますよねたまにこうこうねそういうふうに首にできるだけ首や肩に力が入らないようにすることが大切なんですそういう意味で私もねあの肩当てはしてなくて昔はね私もこうこうで挟こう肩当てしてたこと挟んでたんですけどもう最近はもうこう,もうこうやって左手で持つようにして演奏しておりますこうねあの練習すればこういうのあのビブラートもこうポジション移動もねできるようになりますんで<笑>あのぜひあの試していただきたいと思うんですけどねで後にそのメニューインがあの透明のねあのバイオリンを使ってねそれあの解説されてるんですけどこう鎖骨の上にバイオリンを乗せてで頭の重みでこういうふうに支えるって言ってますね。それでこう左手で持ち上げていくねそれでこう押さえる指と親指で挟んでここをねここのネックとこの人差し指のところをこう開けるのが非常に重要やということをその動画で言ってますねはいこうすることでやっぱりビブラートもかけやすくなりますしこう隣の弦とかにね触れにくく触れにくく指をこう並べることがでできるんですねここつけてるとちょっとちょっと動きも看板になるし隣の弦とかに触れやすくなるんですよねですからちょっと難しいですけどこういうふうにここを開けるようにしてこうあの押さえるように私は最近そのようにして、えー、っと練習しておりますで以前はねこう親指を出してこう演奏してたんですけどそれがね親指出してるとここは開けにくいですよねやっぱりねこれでやっぱり上手にねこう開けれる方はいいですよねシェ,リシェリングとかで、ね、上手にこう親指出しててもこう開けてますよねこうねそうできる人は別に親指出しててもいい,い,いと思うんですけどなかなか難しいですよこう親指出してここ常にこう開けとくというのはねこうはいですから、まあ、一般の方はやっぱりこう親指をこう下,下でこう支えてそれで押さえる指と親指で挟み込んでここを開けるように、えー、このようにされるといいかなと思いますはい
そういうのはねちょっとメニューの動画を少しだけね、えー、ご覧いただきたいと思いますでそれではどうぞ violin, but this may help to demonstrate the position you will see better at least through it now the violin rests on the collarbone and the head rests lightly on the violin free to move either from side to side or backwards and forwards the reason for that is to leave the shoulder quite free you can see how the shoulder can move that way the other point of support is at the hand here you will notice how high the knuckles are pushed so as to leave plenty of space not only between the fingers as you can see but between the fingers and the fingerboard you will notice the, the space the rounded space within the hand between the inside of the hand and the fingerboard it is important that the violin should be supported and touched only with the finger tip and the soft pad of the thumb you will also notice that the fingers rise almost vertically off the fingerboard and that the level of the knuckles from which the fingers fall is above the level of the fingerboard you will also notice the space between the fingers they should be trained to fall naturally equidistant from each other and in this position the elbow is free to swing the shoulder is independent the fingers can rise well above the fingerboard the space everywhere Karen perhaps you might show me your hold of the violin that's very good if you can increase even more the space between the root joint and the first finger base and keep that soft free that would be very good thank you Karen now to begin to find this hold I think it is best to start with the violin hanging from the collarbone and the head and see if we can keep the shoulder free at this point everything is hanging and relaxed and the shoulder as you will see is not concerned with the support of the violin it can be moved away to be quite independent of the violin to raise the violin let us put the thumb on one side of the neck and the second finger on the other not all the way down because at this angle with the hand closer to our body it's easier to raise the violin and to hold it up now as we raise the violin you will see the thumb remains in it in its angle right angle vertically and I lift my head to make room for the violin for the new angle of the violin I place the head back on again all the while as the violin has been coming up we have been creating more and more room for the whole arm which is now quite free the violin is resting on the pad of the thumb which is still nearly vertical I'm not allowing the thumb to support the violin from below the neck nor to fall into the crook between the fingers nor do I bring up my shoulder to hold the violin because then I would lose all the freedom I have been creating with the shoulder free perhaps an easier way to find the feel of the violin hold is with the help of a crutch a wall or a hand rosemary perhaps I might demonstrate on you now let me support the violin let the arm hang first of all right down and now bring up your hand to playing position not disturbing the softness in the arm no responsibility in the shoulder put your third and fourth finger on the A and E string raise the knuckles well above the fingerboard keep this straight thumb a little more on the side of the neck go well into your root joint now I will gradually leave go and try to keep the same softness that's very good there was perhaps a little strain here that's fine Rosemary thank you now to achieve this position properly we'll have to begin with exercises and we will begin with thumb exercises 
This is a good exercise for the thumb joint, rolling it around the neck from its tip to its middle joint. Here's another exercise. If I lift my head and add a finger or two, doing the same motion with the thumb, I can rotate the violin between my thumb and fingers. Here is a further exercise which involves not only the thumb but allows the hand to rise with the elbow and the elbow swing. The thumb does almost the same motion as it did but as the hand rises it goes into the root of the thumb which you can see. This is the fourth thumb exercise, which is in a sense complementary to the last one you have seen. With the head very lightly resting on the chin rest, and the hand in its highest position above the fingerboard, right into the root of the thumb, we lift the violin by means of the thumb alone. Now, for the first time, let us move in the finger. I don't mean by that moving the finger up or down, off the string, along the string, up and down the fingerboard, vibrating, but merely letting the finger rest without pressing the string down, rest lightly on the string, and move again as high as we can above that finger without changing the angle of the first joint of the finger, the joint that is next to the string. In doing this, we must also remember that we must create space, space inside this hollow between the violin and the arm. To do that, we must let the shoulder drop each time we raise the hand. The shoulder drops back. We must not allow the shoulder to join in the same direction of movement like that. That would paralyze us. But like, we must do this. Here is Elizabeth doing the complementary exercise. Here the arm remains still, while the violin is being raised by the action of the thumb. All the while, the angle of the first joint of the finger, the joint next to the string remains constant. The object of this exercise is to increase the strength and the speed of the lift of the fingers and to avoid the clamping down of the fingers on the strings. we come to the important point, the great moment, of applying our pressure to the string. Pressure is again a misnomer, because like hold, it implies a squeezing, but it is actually only the strengthening of the arch of the finger so that it may receive the weight, or a fraction rather, of the weight of the whole arm. In this feeling, there is rather an extension, an expansion of space, with the shoulder relaxing, surrendering its weight, relaxing backwards, allowing the elbow to swing a little more around the violin, so as again to bring more weight directly vertically over the fingertip. The fingertip must sit squarely over the string, so that the string traverses the finger diagonally and so that some of the soft part, the soft part of the finger, rests equally on both sides of the string. There's no need to press the string more than this. In other words, the soft part need not be squeezed onto the fingerboard. 
only as much as is required to carry the weight that will stop the string at that point so that it may vibrate clearly. The finger also must never pull the string to one side like that or push the string away to the other side. In other words, the weight must always fall directly, vertically, squarely on to the string. And this happens with its accompanying sensation in the shoulder and the elbow, as I described. Each time a finger comes down, even when it happens microscopically, and in any position on the fingerboard. In fact, a repeated, uh, a re the repeated falling of the finger is a very good preparatory exercise to the vibrato. Now that we have secured the finger to its point of contact on the fingerboard, we can begin using the horizontal swing parallel to the fingerboard and the strings. Here, the first joint of the finger, of course, changes its angle from this folded to the almost flat. As we do this exercise, you will notice how the motion goes from the fingers into the knuckles and indeed into the wrist. And we also feel a rise as we pull the violin away as we move into the flat direction. At no time should the fingers touch each other, neither that way in the flat, nor that way in the folded. Continuing the same horizontal motion, I would like to describe the involvement of the head and the shoulder. As we move our hand, pulling it away from our body, we are pulling the violin away from its hold between the collarbone and the head. The head, therefore, must allow its weight to fall and pull itself back, holding the violin, preventing it from sliding out. On the other hand, when we move the fingers toward the body, the head can be absolutely free of any responsibility. As to the shoulder, which remains quite free of the head, independent of the head, when we pull the violin away, its reaction is to fall back. When we push toward the body, its reaction is to come forward. This, however, does not occur simultaneously in a mechanical way like that. But rather, does the shoulder anticipate the hand making room for it? And it happens in a wave pattern. The movement of, of the shoulder is, of course, shared by the elbow, which also anticipates. Now we can resolve our three pairs of motions, the vertical, up and down, up and down, the horizontal, with the fingers on one spot, backwards and forward, and the lateral swing of the whole arm into one three-dimensional circle, involving every joint of the fingers, the hand, knuckles, wrists, elbow and indeed shoulder, first in the clockwise direction, and in the anti-clockwise. Now we have three exercises concerned with the reciprocal flexibility of the thumb and the fingers. In the first, the finger remains on its spot and the thumb is moved and in fact is helped being moved by the finger. 
In this exercise, it does not matter if the root of the first finger is very lightly moving against the outside of the fingerboard. In the second exercise, the thumb remains on its spot and the finger moves either in a palm smack bounce above the thumb or smack bouncing with the back of the hand below the thumb. This resolves into one action like that. In our third exercise, we are moving the thumb and the finger in opposite directions. We do this all the while we are keeping the lightest possible of holds, both between the collarbone and the head, the chin that is, and the, on the other hand between the finger and the thumb. Now we come to an interesting motion, the lateral motion across the strings of the fingers. This is the plucking sound and is perhaps the oldest sound associated with stringed instruments. The harp and the lute, the guitar, even the harpsichord were plucked instruments. In this motion we see that the finger moves across the string. The first joint is always bent, depressed a little bit to get the purchase on the string. before releasing it. And the plucking itself that must not ignore the rest of the hand. As you see, there is a sympathetic motion even in the wrist. Now, this motion is possible in all positions, either when the hand is across the strings in this way, or when we bring the fourth finger over to the lowest string, to the G string. Here, as you see, the hand has to be higher, the knuckles have to be higher in order to permit the finger to pluck the string than it is here. We must not forget that to play the violin, we must also be able to move the fingers horizontally along the length of the strings, this way, with each finger, always involving the cooperation of the joints, not only of the finger and the knuckles, but the wrist and the elbow, and in fact, the whole arm. We can also move two fingers simultaneously in opposite directions. However, when we move the second and third finger in opposite directions, between the anchors of the first and the fourth finger, there is much less whole arm or even wrist movement. The effort is concentrated more particularly in the fingers and the hand. There are a series of exercises, in fact, in several volumes, called The Independence of the Fingers by Dunis, a remarkable man who invented them, wherein each finger is required to do a different movement. Thus, assuming the third finger to be stationary, the fourth finger does a lateral movement, the second finger a plucking movement, while the first does a vertical movement. If the fourth finger is stationary, for instance, the third finger can do the lateral, the second finger the vertical, and the first finger the plucking. if one of you tried to do this, you'd feel like the centipede who became paralyzed when he began to wonder which foot he should move first. In any case, we've gone about as far as we can with the left hand without hearing what the left hand is doing. But first we will have to learn how to move the bow on the strings and that will be the subject of our next lesson.